Good day, I'm Dr. Hannah de Guzman and I will be talking about one of the essential aspects of the ophthalmic examination, which is the evaluation of the optic nerve. I have no financial interest in any of the equipment or products mentioned in this talk. There will be sl slides in this talk with many disc photos on that one slide, so I suggest that you just pause the talk when you want to view the discs more closely and for a longer period of time. So why do we need to examine the optic nerve? Well, this is where the damage caused by glaucoma is most visible. The optic nerve is a bundle of the axons of all of the retinal ganglion cells as they pass through on their way to the brain. The bundled axons form the yellow-orange neuroretinal rim and the extra space is seen as the pale optic cup. As the RGCs die off in glaucoma, they undergo apoptosis. Their axons disappear from the disc, and the fewer remaining axons occupy a smaller space, hence the thinning of the rim with corresponding enlargement of the cup. So remember that it is important to look at the rim and not the cup. These are what we want to find out when we examine the optic nerve. Naturally, we need to examine the optic nerve at the initial visit, but we also need to check at every follow-up visit because there can be changes that occur overnight. I will talk about these changes later on. The gold standard for examining the optic nerve is stereoscopic examination using a slit lamp and a fundus lens, such as a 60, 78, or 90 diopter lens. You might need to dilate the patient's pupils after you have checked with your gonio lens that it is safe to do that. Young patients with relatively large pupils um, may be examined without dilation and you will still be able to get a stereoscopic view but any other patient you will probably need to dilate the pupils just because you can see the disc with your fundus lens while you're examining at the slit lamp does not necessarily mean you are getting a stereo view so it's possible that only one eye is seeing the disc so you need to check by closing one eye and then the other to make sure that you can, are seeing the disc with both eyes at the same time. A direct ophthalmoscope is not recommended because of the monocular view. So what do we need to look for? Well, that is the main topic of this talk. First, we need to distinguish normal from abnormal. But to do that, we need to know what normal looks like. So what is normal? Well, people can be very different from each other in appearance, in size, shape, skin color, so many features that can all vary. Well, the same can be said of the optic disc. So these are all healthy, normal optic discs with no glaucoma. So see how different they all look from each other. So keep in mind that normal can take on many forms. It's only by familiarizing ourselves with the many variations of normal that we will be able to reliably identify abnormal discs. These are the features of a typical not normal disc. We will be discussing them one by one. The first feature is size. The average disc has a diameter of 1.7 to 1.8 millimeters vertically. But this can vary quite a lot. In fact, it's probably the disc feature that varies the most. So there's the average size disc, and then there are the large and small discs, 
and the extra large ones that I like to call jumbo. This that are even smaller than the small one here might be already in the realm of what we consider hypoplastic discs. The next, next disc feature is shape. The typical disc is slightly vertically oval with a horizontally oval cup. But discs can come in other shapes and yet still be normal. And the shape of the cup follows the shape of the disc somewhat. So this is the typical disc, vertically oval with a horizontally oval cup. But for example, you can have a disc that is more vertically oval than usual and naturally the cup will be more vertically oval. So just because you see a vertically oval cup, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is glaucoma, although we have been taught that a vertically oval cup indicates glaucoma because of the thinning of the neuroretinal rim at the superior and inferior poles. So just remember, you need to take the shape of the disc into consideration. The next disc feature is the isn't rule. The isn't rule states that the thickness of the isn't of the inferior rim is greater than or equal to the thickness of the superior rim, which is greater than or equal to the thickness of the nasal rim, which in turn is greater than or equal to the thickness of the temporal rim. So remember what I said earlier, that it is the rim that it is important for us to look at. Now here is where we might safely use the word normal. The normal disc has a yellow-orange neuroretinal rim. The color is also sometimes described as pinkish-yellow. Any color other than that is not normal. So in glaucoma, the neuroretinal rim retains its color despite getting thinner. So see this normal, non-glaucomatous disc with a yellow-orange rim. In this case of moderate glaucoma, the rim is still yellow-orange, and the same in this advanced case of glaucoma, still yellow-orange rim. So, if the rim is pale, then a different type of damage has affected that nerve. This is not to say that glaucomatous discs can't be pale. Eyes that have endured an episode of extremely high IOP can sometimes manifest with discs that are both pale and also have glaucomatous cupping. So it's not mutually exclusive. But you need to remember to take the ocular media into consideration when evaluating the rim color. This patient is pseudophagic on the right eye and has a mild cataract on the left eye, which gives everything a yellowish tinge. So if you did not know that, then you might think that this disc is slightly pale. Most people have similar looking optic nerve heads in the two eyes. Such as this example. So you may have been taught that asymmetry in the cup to disc ratio is a sign of glaucoma. This is true, but only if the discs are the same size. Asymmetry in disc size is easy to spot when looking at side-by-side -side photos such as what we're doing now, but it's a lot harder when you're looking at one eye at a time. So this example, it's very obvious. Later, I will be explaining methods for estimating or measuring the disc size while examining the patient. But when you're just eyeballing it like what we're doing now, the caliber of the retinal vessels is your clue. There's not much variation in the caliber of vessels from one individual to the other. 
So if the vessel seems small compared to the overall size of the disc, then that's probably a large disc. With practice, you'll get better at estimating the disc size just by looking at it without using any special instruments or maneuvers. In this example, the difference between the two discs is less obvious than in the previous slide. It's easier to see the difference when I put these reference circles. In this case, the difference is very subtle. Then there is also a typical vessel pattern. Typically, the central retinal vein and artery emerge just nasal to the center of the disc. But as with most of the features we've discussed so far, there are many normal discs that do not exactly look like that. You may have been taught that nasalization of the vessels is an indicator of glaucoma, but remember that that is only true sometimes. So far, I've been talking about disc features. Although the retinal nerve fiber layer is not strictly part of the disc, examination of the RNFL is an integral part of the examination of the glaucoma patient. The RNFL is seen as refractile striations extending radially from the disc. It is thickest and thus most visible, superior and inferior to the disc, which corresponds to the relatively thicker superior and inferior rims. The thicker it is, the more it obscures the retinal vessels. The appearance of the RNFL is called a reflex. The OCT RNFL thickness map on the right shows the normal thickness distribution of the RNFL. Hotter colors indicate thicker RNFL. So what we've learned so far is that normal discs can look very different from each other. Thus, we need to keep looking at our patient's discs so that we learn what normal looks like. So we come to the next step, which is abnormal discs. Hopefully in the last few minutes, you've gained some insight into what normal discs look like. So that now we can start to learn what glaucoma does to the optic disc. These are seven important features that we need to look at when evaluating a disc for glaucoma. The various optic nerve head signs that we see vary in their significance. From this point on, stars on the slide will indicate the relative strength of that sign as an indicator of glaucoma. First, we need to consider the disc size. The disc size is our reference point from which we will proceed to evaluate the rest of the disc. A large disc will naturally have a large cup. A small disc should have a small cup, or the cup could even be absent. All that is needed is enough space for the 1 to 1.2 million RGC axons. So a large cup can mean that part of the rim has disappeared, or that there is just a lot of extra space in that disc. It all depends on the size of the disc. So as long as the area here is enough for 1 to 1.2 million axons, and this area here is also enough for 1, .2, for 1 to 1.2 million axons, it doesn't matter how big this area is. Here we see evidence that smaller cups do indeed have smaller cup-to-disc ratios, 
and larger cups have larger cup to disc ratios. Since the average vertical disc diameter is 1.7 to 1.8 millimeters, then the average cup to disc ratio should be around 0.45 to 0.5. So I cannot stress enough the importance of considering the disc size when talking about the cup to disc ratio. The most precise way of measuring the disc diameter at the slit lamp is by using a reticule that you can attach to your fundus lens which has gradations which you can use to measure the disc. But this is an extra piece of equipment that most of us don't have. So, we can estimate the disc size without any extra equipment by measuring the disc diameter using the height of the slit beam and multiplying that measurement by the magnification factor of your fundus lens. Take note that lenses of the same dioptric power may have different magnification factors. For example, the Vogue Superfield 78 diopter lens has an image magnification of 0.77x, but a standard 78 diopter lens, not the Superfield, has an image magnification of 1. But you have to remember that this method, method only gives an estimate of the disc size because it is affected by factors such as the patient's error of refraction. To spare myself from having to do multiplication every time I examine a patient, I've made a quick reference guide and attached it to my lens case. So I just look at the column on the left, which is the actual measurement that I got using the slit lamp, and then match it with the number on the right column. Another way of measuring disk size is by using imaging technology. The old Stratus OCT gives the disk diameter, while the newer OCTs usually give a disk area. But you have to check that the disk border was correctly identified by the technician in the case of the Stratus or by the machine in the case of the HRT or the newer OCTs. The second feature that we need to examine is the neuroretinal rim. As we've said before, the typical disc has a horizontally oval cup because of the naturally thicker superior and inferior rims. Glaucoma damage tends to start at the superior and inferior rims, thus causing the previously horizontally oval cup to become vertically oval as what you can see in the photo on the right. The neuroretinal rim is bounded by the scleral ring and the cup edge. The cup edge can usually be identified by the bending of the vessels as they hug the neuroretinal rim. So here, this is where the vessels bend and this is where the cup ends. Same here, vessels bend. Here too, vessels bend. However, there are discs where the vessel patterns do not bend with the rim. So for example here, it's hard to identify the rim in these cases. Another difficulty when identifying the cup edge is in discs with sloping rims, such as the disc on the right. So a cross section of that disc might look like this. This is in contrast to the disc on the left, which has a very well-defined cup edge. And a cross section of that might look like this.
there are also difficulties identifying the rim when coming from the other side. People of pigmented races sometimes have a crescent-shaped gray discoloration of the outer edge of the neuroretinal rim, usually located in paratemporally or temporally. If the gray part is mistaken as being not part of the rim, then the disc can be falsely labeled as glaucomatous. On this slide, the correctly identified disc edge is on the left. In this example, the correctly identified disc border is on the left. Peripapillary atrophy can also confuse the identification of the outer disc border. In this glaucomatous disc, the exposed scleral ring can be mistaken as being part of the rim. The junction of the exposed scleral ring with the hyperpigmented peripapillary atrophy can be mistaken as the disc border. In this slide, the correctly identified disc border is on the left. In this case of well demarcated and smooth edged peripapillary atrophy, one could mistake the peripapillary atrophy for a gray crescent, leading to the conclusion that the rim is wider than it actually is. This is the correctly identified disc border. The easiest glaucomatous sign to look for in the neuroretinal rim is violation of the ISN rule. The rim is usually thickest inferiorly and thinnest temporally. This extends to the peripapillary RNFL, which is why the RNFL forms the classic double hump pattern that we can measure using the various imaging technologies. Here, the isn't rule is highlighted on this normal disc. When the isn't rule is violated, such as in the glaucomatous disc on the right, that is a two-star indicator of glaucoma. Here you see that the nasal rim and not the inferior rim is the thickest. Focal thinning of the neuroretinal rim is a strong indicator of glaucoma. A very sharp area of focal thinning of the rim is called a notch, and it is a three-star indicator of glaucoma. Thinning of the nasal neuroretinal rim, also called nasal cupping, is also a three-star indicator of glaucoma. Pallor of the optic cup is normal, and it is also seen in glaucoma. Pallor of any part of the rim is a sign of non-glaucomatous optic nerve damage. So when the area of the pallor is greater than the area of the cup, then that means there is an element of non-glaucomatous damage that has occurred to that disc. Pallor can be diffuse or focal. The case on the right is Kerr's hereditary optic neuropathy. The appearance of the disc on the left is nonspecific and can occur with a variety of neuroophthalmic conditions. The vessels can also show signs of glaucomatous change. When blood vessels appear to undercut the scleral ring or the neuroretinal rim before exiting the deepened cup, it is called bayoneting of the vessels. This is a two-star indicator of glaucoma. If you check for the word bayoneting in the dictionary, you won't find it. You'll only find it in ophthalmic books. Bayonetting can affect multiple blood vessels, as in these examples.
When the rim has undercut the squirrel ring in all sectors of the disc, that is what is known as a bean pot disc. This is usually accompanied by bayoneting of multiple vessels. Nasalization of the blood vessels is a weak indicator of glaucoma because even normal discs can have nasalization. And glaucomatous discs may not necessarily have prominent nasalization of the vessels, as you can see on the right. Circumlinear vessels are small vessels that run or curve along the rim. When the rim has receded, but the vessels remain in place, an area of pallor appears, and this is what is called bearing of the circumlinear vessels. Optociliary shunt vessels are dilated tortuous vessels that uh, are collateral vessels, and they can occur in many different conditions, not necessarily glaucoma. As a diagnostic indicator, disc hemorrhages are only a two-star indicator of glaucoma. But when they are seen in established cases of glaucoma, they are a strong predictor of progression. I mentioned earlier that we need to examine the disc at every visit. Rim thinning will not progress overnight, but disc hemorrhages can suddenly appear. So this is what we need to check for at every visit. Sometimes they are very obvious, such as in these examples, but they can also be very subtle, such as in these examples. So it is important that we need to be very thorough when examining the disc. Disc hemorrhages are eventually resorbed. Sometimes they leave behind a thinner rim, a new RNFL defect, or a new visual field defect. The RNFL follows a specific anatomic pattern, so you need to keep this image in mind every time you examine an optic disc and when you are interpreting visual field tests. So here is a larger image so that you can appreciate what the healthy RNFL looks like. So see the striations coming out of the disc. These are two more examples of healthy RNFL. Diffuse loss of the RNFL is a strong indicator of glaucoma. However, it can be hard to detect, especially in older individuals, in those with hazy ocular media, and in those with a tigroid fundus. One clue is the bearing of the retinal vessels. See how sharp the edges of the retinal vessels are in this photo on the right with diffuse RNFL loss. Compare that to the appearance of the retinal vessels in the healthy eye with the thick RNFL. So the borders of the vessels are a bit fuzzy in this picture. Another reason that it's difficult to detect diffuse loss is because you have nothing to compare it against, meaning the entire fundus is the same, looks the same, as compared to a case with focal loss. Focal loss is usually more noticeable than diffuse loss, but it can still be difficult to detect. Focal RNFL defects are also a strong indicator of glaucoma. They are sometimes easier to see using red-free photography or using the green filter of your slit lamp. You usually need a well-dilated pupil to see these. Here's another example of a focal RNFL defect. 
in this eye, there are multiple RNFL defects. Pigmentary changes in the peripapillary area are called peripapillary atrophy. Alpha peripapillary atrophy is nonspecific. Here's another example of alpha peripapillary atrophy. Beta peripapillary atrophy, on the other hand, is a weak indicator of glaucoma. However, when the PPA is located nasally, it doesn't matter whether it's alpha or beta. It is still a weak indicator of glaucoma. The lamina fibrosa is another feature we need to examine. Laminar dots or pores are sometimes visible in normal discs. They are usually round. But when the laminar dots are oval or slit-like, then that may be an indicator of glaucoma. Slit-like laminar dots tend to be associated with backward bowing of the lamina cribrosa. In summary, glaucomatous disc features include a large cup to disc ratio, but remember to consider the disc size. The cup to disc ratio may be asymmetric, the rim is thin, the cup becomes more vertically oval, but remember to consider the baseline cup shape, which depends on the baseline disc shape. The isn't rule may be violated, although this rule does not always apply. There are various vessel changes that can occur. The RNFL is lost, and peripapillary and lamina cribrosa changes can also occur. The more signs that are present, the greater the likelihood of glaucoma. When multiple signs are in the same area, the diagnosis is practically guaranteed. After we have learned to identify glaucomatous discs, we now need to correlate this with the rest of the clinical picture and to monitor for progression. Regular examination of the discs, preferably with photographic documentation, will help us in detecting progression. Thank you for listening.